Welcome back to Pristressed Concrete Structures. This is the sixth lecture of module 4 on design of members. In this lecture, we shall study the detailing requirements for flexure. We shall also study the detailing requirements for shear and torsion to get a complete picture of the detailing requirements. First, the detailing requirements for flexure. The detailing of the pre-stressing tendons and the reinforcing bars is important to satisfy the assumptions in the analysis, proper placement of concrete and durability. It is essential to show the detailing in the design drawings and to check them in the shop drawings. IS 1343 1980 specifies some minimum requirements. Here, those requirements are briefly mentioned. Till now, we have studied the design of the pre stressing steel and the location of the pre stressing steel, but it is also very important to show those design results in the drawings. The detailing of the other reinforcement is equally important and these detailings have to be shown in the design drawings so that a person who is fabricating the steel cage does not have any doubt during the fabrication. The detailing is important because we have to satisfy the assumptions that we had made during the design stage. The placement of concrete should be proper regarding durability and the detailing requirements also satisfy the durability requirements as mentioned by the code. First, we are studying about the tendon profile in a beam. For a simply supported post tension beam with uniformly distributed load, a parabolic profile is selected. The equation of the profile is given as follows, y is equal to 4 times y m divided by l square times x times l minus x. Here y m is the displacement of the tendon from the ends at the middle. L is the length of the beam, x is the distance from one end, y is the vertical displacement of the profile at distance x. Thus, the first thing we need to know while placing the tendon is that what is the vertical location of the tendons with respect to a reference height? The equation helps us to determine this vertical location of the tendon along the span of the beam. In this photograph, you can see that there are tendons which are placed in a parabolic fashion in a simply supported bridge girder and the location of the tendon during the fabrication of the reinforcement is extremely important. 
the ducts are placed within the reinforcement cage as per the design drawings and then the strands are passed through the ducts which finally will be very close to the design assumptions. For continuous beams or slabs, parabolic profiles at the spans and at the supports are connected to get the continuous profile of a tendon. We shall discuss about continuous beams and slabs in different modules. Here we are just mentioning about the tendon profile in such systems. In a continuous beam, the tendon has parabolic profiles in the spans and as well as over the supports. The parabolic profiles in the span is much longer than the parabolic profiles over the supports. There are some key points in laying out this profile. First for the end span, we start from the CGC that means the CGS is located at the CGC. Then as we move towards the middle of the end span, we have the point of maximum eccentricity. Then as we move towards the first support, we have a point of contraflexion or an inflection point where the tendon changes its curvature. Then we move on to the support point where the tendon has the maximum eccentricity above the CGC and then again as we come down the CGS has a point of contraflexure and again at the middle of the interior span it reaches a height at the critical location. Now each of these key points are connected by parabolic segments. A parabolic segment connects a point of maximum eccentricity with a point of contraflexure. For varying spans and loading, the segments on two sides of a point of maximum eccentricity may not be symmetric. The important point is that from one point to another, it is connected by a parabolic segment, but the next segment need not be symmetric as that of the previous segment. In this sketch, we have one parabolic segment from the end to the critical section of the end span. Then we have a second parabolic segment from the critical section at the end span to the point of contraflexure. Then we have a third parabolic segment from the point of contraflexure to the critical section over the support and like that we have the fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh segments. All this can have individual equations based on the locations of the point of contraflexure and the locations of the points of maximum eccentricity. The important feature is that at the point of contraflexure, the two parabolic segments on the two sides should have the same slope and at the points of maximum eccentricity, the two parabolic segments on the two sides should have the same slope which is 0. The convex segment over a support is required to avoid a kink in the tendon. We cannot have a sharp kink in the tendon, that is why we need to provide a small parabolic segment over the support. The length of a convex segment is determined based on the minimum radius of curvature for the type of tendon. Thus, from the parabolic equation, 
we find out the radius of curvature and the radius of curvature over the support should satisfy a minimum value for the type of tendon that is being used. A parabolic segment satisfies two conditions. It has zero slope at the point of maximum eccentricity. At a point of contraflexion, the slopes of the segments on both sides should match. These are the two boundary conditions which determines the constants of the parabolic equation. Next, we are writing the equation of a parabolic segment which connects the point of maximum eccentricity with a point of contraflexure y is equal to y m times x by l whole square. In this equation, y m is the vertical displacement of the CGS from the point of maximum eccentricity, l is the length of the parabolic segment and x is the distance from the point of maximum eccentricity and y is the vertical displacement of the profile at distance x. The origin is selected at the point of maximum eccentricity for a particular segment and this maximum eccentricity is at the critical location. Thus the equation satisfies the first boundary condition of zero slope at the point of maximum eccentricity. That means the form of the equation that we have selected for the parabolic profile that satisfies the first boundary condition that it has to have zero slope at the point of maximum eccentricity. The length L is determined from the requirement of minimum radius of curvature at the support. That means over the support we have to have a minimum length of the parabolic profile over the support so as to satisfy the requirement of minimum curvature. Now once we determine that, we can determine the complementary length of the parabolic segment in the span and that length is substituted in the expression of the parabolic curve. The displacement y m is determined from the boundary condition at the point of contraflexure where the slopes of the segments on both sides should match. That is how do we determine y m that at the point of contraflexure which we have located based on the requirement of minimum radius of curvature over the support. Now, once we have located the point of contraflexure we can get the vertical displacement of the point of contraflexure from the point of maximum eccentricity in the span by the requirement that the slope of the two parabolic segments on the two sides should be equal. That means we write the generic expression of the slope of one side and the slope of the other side, we equate them and like that we find out the value of y m which is the displacement of the point of contraflexure from the point of maximum eccentricity and like that we are able to write the equation of the parabolic segment. This figure shows the tendon profiles in a continuous bridge girder and here you can see that the tendons have come up near the support and they satisfy the minimum requirement of curvature and again beyond the support they go down to satisfy the maximum eccentricity as per the design in the span. Thus the profile of the tendon is a very important detailing requirement in the design of pre-stress concrete members. The profile is implemented by the use of hangers or crossbars or chairs 
of varying depth at regular intervals. In beams, the duct is supported by hangers from the top bars or by crossbars attached to the stirrups. The depth of the hanger or crossbar at a location can be calculated from the equation of the profile. In slabs, the duct is supported on chairs resting on the formwork. Once we have got the equation of the parabolic profile, we can design the location of the tendon along the length of the beam and the tendon is located at that particular height by the help of hangers or some crossbars or some chairs and the depth of the hangers or the crossbars can be determined from the parabolic equation. In slabs, there are chairs of varying height so that we can able to implement the parabolic profile and once these are calculated, they should be mentioned in the design drawings so that the person who is laying out the duct, that person should not have any ambiguity regarding the layout of the duct. There is another feature in the tendon profile is that the CGS of the tendon shifts from the center line of the duct after stretching. The following sketches show the shifts at the low and high points of the tendon. The shift in the CGS is available from the type of tendon used and can be accounted for in precise calculations. That is, although we may have placed the duct as per the requirement, once the tendons are stretched, the CGS of the tendon may not lie in the center line of the duct. At a low point, after the stretching, the tendons touch the upper surface of the duct and hence the CGS shifts from the center line of the duct, whereas at a high point, the tendons touch the bottom surface of the duct and hence the CGS shifts towards the bottom. This shift may be included if we want precise calculations of the location of the CGS. Next we are moving on to the requirements of reinforcement. The first one is the minimum longitudinal reinforcement. A minimum amount of longitudinal reinforcement should be provided to have sufficient strength after the cracking of concrete. Although the pre-stressed concrete members are expected to crack at a much higher load, but after it cracks, it should not reach its strength immediately. In that case, again the failure will be quite sudden. Hence, the code prescribes a minimum amount of reinforcement such that its ultimate strength is greater than its cracking strength by a certain amount. According to section 18.6.3.3a, the minimum amount is as follows. The minimum amount is given as a summation of the amount of pre-stressing steel and the amount of additional flexural steel that the minimum AS plus AP should be equal to 0 0.2 percent of the total cross section area. Here, AS is the area of steel without pre-stressing if we have for flexural strength. AP is the area of pre-stressing steel and A is the total area of cross-section. Remember that here AS does not include the temperature or shrinkage reinforcement which are not supposed to carry any flexure and hence AS is the steel which has been specifically designed for the flexural strength in a partially pre-stressed member. Thus, the requirement is 
that the total amount of steel which is the amount of pre stressing steel plus the amount of non pre stressed steel if we have for flexural strength the total amount should be at least 0.2 percent of the cross section of the member. This will ensure that the strength is higher than the load at cracking. This expression is of course independent of the cracking strength of the concrete and hence if we are using high strength concrete we have to be cautious about using this expression. The code limits the maximum strength of the concrete to 60 Newton per millimeter square and this equation is applicable up to that grade of concrete. The minimum reinforcement can be reduced to 0.15 percent of the area if high ill strength deformed bars are used as the non pre stressed reinforcement. Thus the code gives us a flexibility to reduce the minimum amount of steel if we are using high strength deformed bars. Next we are studying about the minimum side phase reinforcement. When the depth of the web exceeds 500 millimeters a minimum amount of longitudinal reinforcement should be placed at each phase which are called side phase of the web to check thermal and shrinkage cracks. When the web is deep the flexural steel is located at the bottom near the span and at the top near the supports for a continuous beam. In addition to this steel for flexure the code requires a minimum amount of steel along the side face of the web. This steel is to check thermal and shrinkage cracks in the web. According to section 18.6.3.3b the minimum amount of side face reinforcement which we shall denote as AS comma SF is given as follows. The minimum AS comma SF is equal to 0.05 percent of AW where AW is the vertical area of the web. In a deep section we are providing additional longitudinal steel along the two faces of the web and in each face the amount of this longitudinal steel should be 0.05 percent of the area of the web and this area is the vertical area and another requirement is that the maximum spacing of this bars is 200 millimeters. Thus to check thermal and shrinkage cracks we are providing some distributed side phase reinforcement which are also known as skin reinforcement on the two faces of the web. The next requirement is the minimum cover. A minimum clear cover of concrete is necessary to protect the steel against corrosion and to develop adequate bond between concrete and steel. The cover is implemented by chairs or blocks. We have to remember that when we talk of cover it is not just the cover below the steel but it is also the cover on the two sides of the steel and the requirement of the code is based on a clear cover which means it is from the nearest face of the duct to the edge of the concrete section. According to section 11.1.6 the minimum cover requirements are as follows. For pretension members minimum cover for tendons is 20 millimeters. For post tension members minimum cover for the sheathing 
of the duct is 30 millimeters or size of the tendon. The minimum cover should be increased by 10 millimeters in aggressive environment. The requirement of minimum cover is for durability and also for the development of the bond. If the environment is aggressive or extreme, then the code rec recommends to have increased cover to check the corrosion of the pre-stressing tendons. Remember that the corrosion of a pre-stressing tendon has much adverse effect as compared to the corrosion of a non-pre-stress reinforcement. Hence, the court specifies a minimum cover of 20 millimeters for pre-tension members and for post-tension members a minimum cover of 30 millimeters or the size of the tendon which is the clear cover from the outside face of the duct to the face of the concrete section. Next is the minimum spacing between the tendons. A minimum clear spacing of the tendons or reinforcing bars is necessary for the flow of concrete during casting and for the bond between concrete and steel. When we are talking of the spacing, it is the clear spacing between the ducts. That means it is between the inner faces of the ducts that we are talking about in measuring the clear spacing. According to section 11.1.7, the minimum spacing requirements are as follows. For single wares in a pretension member, the clear spacing should be greater than 3 times the wire diameter. It should be also greater than 1 and 1 third times the maximum aggregate size. For large bars or tendons, the clear spacing should be greater than 40 millimeters. It should be also greater than the maximum size of tendon or bar and it should be also greater than the maximum aggregate size plus 5 millimeters. Thus, we have to provide a minimum spacing between the tendons so that the concrete can flow between the tendons and the tendons can develop a proper bond with the concrete. If we are grouping the tendons, then the requirement is for the spacing between the groups of tendons. The code allows to have maximum 4 tendons in a group. In this sketch, we have shown 4 groups of tendons where in each group there are 4 tendons and when we are referring to the spacing, we are referring to the spacing between the groups. There is a requirement of a vertical spacing and there is a requirement of a horizontal spacing. According to section 11.1.8, for group tendons, the spacing requirement are as follows. The horizontal spacing should be greater than or equal to 40 millimeters or it should be greater than or equal to the maximum aggregate size plus 5 millimeters. The vertical spacing has to be greater than or equal to 50 millimeters. It is preferred that the tendons are placed in a one vertical plane and the minimum spacing between the tendons in the vertical direction has to be 50 millimeters. Next, we are studying about the minimum longitudinal reinforcement with unbounded tendons. In a post tension member, when the ducts are not grouted, beyond the cracking load, the number of cracks is small and the crack width is large. To reduce the crack width, and to distribute the cracking, a minimum amount of non-pre-stress reinforcement 
should be provided. Since the non-precious reinforcement is bonded to the concrete, there are several cracks with small crack width. This is a sketch where the member does not have any non-precious reinforcement and in that situation, when the load increases beyond the cracking load, then we can observe that there is a single large crack with a substantially large crack width. This is detrimental for the tendon and hence this is not allowed by the code. We should have a minimum amount of non pristress reinforcement which will help to distribute the crack along the span of the beam and the crack width will get reduced. This is a much better situation regarding the durability and the performance of the beam as compared to the beam without any non pristress reinforcement. As per the code of the American Concrete Institute, which is SEI 318, the minimum amount of such reinforcement is 0 0.4 percent AT, where AT is the area under tension between the centroid of the section CGC and the tension edge. The above reinforcement is not intended to provide flexural strength. The way this reinforcement is calculated is that we are considering the area which is under tension and that area is given by the part which is between the CGC and the extreme tension phase. We are denoting that area by AT and the minimum amount of non pristress reinforcement with unbounded tendons is equal to 0.4 percent of that area AT. And this reinforcement will help to distribute the cracks and the crack width will should be small. Our next requirement is the anchorage of reinforcement. In pre-stressed concrete section, if it has non pre-stressed reinforcement which contributes to flexural strength, the development length of the bars need to be checked at the critical section. As we had talked earlier that a pre-stressing tendon develops its strength through the bond in case of a pre-tension member or through the anchorage in case of a post tension member. But the non pre-stressed reinforcement in a partially pre-stressed member should have adequate development length and which is measured from the critical section. In this lecture, we are not going into the details of calculating the development length because that is covered in a course of reinforced concrete, but we have to make sure that in our design drawings, we show the development length from the critical section and we satisfy this requirement by providing adequate length or adequate hooks at the ends. The bar should be anchored at the supports by hooks to avoid anchorage failure. That means, the non pristress reinforcement should have proper hooks at the supports, so that we can check anchorage failure due to pull out of the bars near the supports. Next we are moving on to the detailing requirements for shear. The detailing requirements for the stirrups in IS 1343 1980 are briefly mentioned. We shall study the analysis and design for shear in a subsequent module. Here we are discussing the detailing requirements to have a total picture of the detailing of reinforcement in a pre-stressed concrete member. The first requirement 
of the design of stirrups in a pistous concrete beam is the maximum spacing. The maximum spacing is mentioned because it restricts the growth of the cracks. The spacing of the stirrups which is denoted as S is restricted to a maximum value so that a diagonal crack is intercepted by at least one stirrup. The cross section of a typical eye girder is shown. The variables that we will be using are d s is the depth of the centroid of the non pre-stressed seal, d p is the depth of the c g s, h is the total height, b w is the width of the web. In the elevation we see that due to shear or a combination of flexure and shear, the cracks tend to be diagonal. We have to provide stirrups in such a way that there is at least one stirrup to intercept the diagonal crack. And hence, the spacing of the stirrups is restricted to a maximum value. As per clause 22.4.3.2, the maximum spacing is 0 0.75 dt or 4 times bw whichever is smaller. When vu the shear demand is larger than 1.8 vc where vc is the capacity of concrete the maximum spacing is reduced to half of dt. Now, in this expressions B w is the breadth of the web, D t is the greater of D p or D s. That means, whichever steel is at the bottom, we calculate that distance of the steel and we denote that as D t. D p is the depth of the C g s from the extreme compression fiber, D s is the depth of centroid of non priestess steel, V u is the shear force at a section due to ultimate loads, V c is the shear capacity of concrete. We shall learn about the analysis and design in the subsequent module, but here we are mentioning the detailing requirements and the maximum spacing is restricted to 3 quarters of d t or 4 times the width of the web whichever is smaller. In case the shear demand is high, if it is greater than 1.8 times that of the shear capacity of concrete, then the spacing is reduced to half of d t. A minimum amount of stirrups is necessary to restrict the growth of diagonal cracks and subsequent shear failure. As per clause 18.6.3.2, stirrups are recommended for beams with thin webs. The minimum amount of stirrups is given in terms of AWH, which is the horizontal sectional area of the web in plan. Although for low value of the shear demand, the shear capacity of the concrete may be adequate. It is recommended that we provide shear reinforcement at least for beams with thin web. The minimum requirement of the amount of shear reinforcement is based on the horizontal area of the web, which we are denoting as AWH. The horizontal area is explained by this sketch that if we take a section through the web, then the A w h is the area in the plan and based on this area, we calculate the minimum amount of stirrups that should be provided. The minimum amount of stirrups is denoted as A s v comma min. In presence of dynamic load, 
the minimum amount of stirrups is 0.3 percent of AWH. It can be reduced to 0.2 percent AWH when the total height is less than 4 times the breadth of the web. With high strength bars, we can reduce the amount of minimum reinforcement to 0.2 percent AWH. It can be reduced to even 0.15 percent of AWH when the total height is less than 4 times the breadth of the web. In absence of dynamic load, when H is greater than 4 times VWH, the minimum amount of stirrups is equal to 0 0.1 percent AWH. There is no specification for the minimum amount of stirrups when H is smaller than 4 times VWH, but it is recommended that some minimum stirrups is provided in beams, especially if the breadth of the beam is small. The minimum stirrup is required to check any shear failure and to check the growth of diagonal cracks. The stirrups should be anchored to develop the ill stress in the vertical legs. As we anchor the longitudinal steel to develop their capacity, similarly the stirrups should be anchored with the hooks at the top so as to develop their strength under ultimate loads in the vertical legs of the stirrups. The stirrups should be bent close to the compression and tension surfaces satisfying the minimum cover. This is the first requirement of anchoring the stirrups. Next, each bend of the stirrups should be around a longitudinal bar because that longitudinal bar will hold the stirrups at its place. The diameter of the longitudinal bar should not be less than the diameter of the stirrups. That means, the longitudinal bar should be stiff enough to check the movement or to check the opening up of the stirrups. The end of the stirrups should be anchored by standard hooks. The detailing for reinforced concrete should be such that we have standard hooks at the end of the stirrups and those standard hooks are given in the special publication 34 of the Indian standard institution and the standard hooks have a certain minimum radius of curvature and a certain length beyond the bend, so that the stirrups are held in place and they do not move during the increase of the load. The fourth requirement is there should not be any bend in a re-entrant corner. In a re-entrant corner, the stirrup under tension has the possibility to straighten thus breaking the cover concrete. Let us understand what is meant by a re-entrant corner. In this figure, the point where the arrow shows is a re-entrant corner. If we provide a stirrup to match the side of the web, since this stirrup is under tension, it will try to straighten and it will break the cover concrete near the re-entrant corner. Hence, it is not permitted to have a bend near a re-entrant corner. We should have individual stirrups that the stirrup at the bottom is straight in the re-entrant corners and we provide a separate stirrup with the with two bars in, the, in between the web. The sketch on the left is an incorrect detailing where the stirrup has a bend at a re-entrant corner. The correct detailing is that we have separate stirrups 
and we should not have any bend in any one of them near the reentrant corner. Next we are moving on to the detailing requirements for torsion. The detailing requirements for the stirrups for torsion in clause 22.5.5 are briefly mentioned. There should be at least one longitudinal bar in each corner. The minimum diameter of the longitudinal bars is 12 millimeter. Here also we see a similar requirement as for the stirrups for shear that wherever we are bending the stirrups we should provide a longitudinal bar that is stiff enough to hold the stirrup in place. For a torsion design the minimum size of the longitudinal bar to hold the stirrups is 12 millimeters. This is a stringent requirement as compared to the stirrup design for shear. For torsion we provide closed stirrups to carry the circulatory shear. We shall come to the design of this closed stirrups in the module of the analysis and design for torsion. The closed stirrups should be perpendicular to the axis of the beam and the closed stirrups should not be made of pairs of U stirrups lapping one another. That means on the left hand side this is an incorrect detailing where the closed stirrup has been made by lapping two U stirrups. This is not permitted. The correct detailing is that we make the closed stirrup by a single piece of bar with proper hooks at the ends. The maximum spacing of torsion reinforcement is x1 plus y1 divided by 4 or 200 millimeters whichever is smaller. Here x1 and y1 are the short and long dimensions of the stirrups respectively. That means in this sketch x1 is the horizontal dimension, y1 is the vertical dimension and the maximum spacing is given as one quarter of the summation of x1 and y1 or 200 millimeters whichever is small. The fourth requirement is the proper anchorage of stirrups as mentioned under the detailing requirements of shear reinforcement. That means as we had showed the importance of anchorage of the stirrups for shear reinforcement, the similar provisions also apply for the shear reinforcement for torsion. It is recommended to bend the ends of a stirrup by 135 degree and have 10 times the diameter of the bar db as extension beyond the bend. That means at the corner we are bending one bar by a 35 degree and we are bending the other bar also by 35 degree if possible and the extensions of the bar beyond the bends should be minimum 10 times the diameter of the bar and they should extend within the core concrete. Thus for a torsion design the bends should be such that they sh the ends of the bars should enter the core concrete and this will help the st stirrups to sustain the circulatory shear without trying to open up. The stirrups should be continued till a distance h plus bw beyond the point at which it is no longer required by the analysis. Here h is the overall depth and bw is the breadth of the web. This requirement is based on the truss action for torsion resistance and we shall study this requirement in the module for the analysis and design of shear. To repeat that the stirrups should be continued till a distance h plus bw beyond the point 
at which it is no longer required. Here this is a photograph of the detailing of the steel in a pre-stressed concrete member and we can see the importance of the showing the detailing in the design drawing because the persons who are fabricating the steel they should not have ambiguity in placing the steel and the pre-stressing ducts properly. The pre-stressing tendons are laid out in a parabolic profile which should be shown properly in the design drawings. The minimum amount of longitudinal reinforcement and stirrups should be provided. The maximum spacing of the reinforcements should be satisfied and the anchorage details of the reinforcements should also be satisfied. Once the proper concrete cage has been made and it should be inspected to check the compliance with the code and then only the concrete should be poured to make the concrete member. In today's lecture, we studied the detailing requirements of a pre-stressed concrete member. As I mentioned that the detailing requirement is extremely important because we have to satisfy the assumptions that we had made in our design. The detailing requirements are necessary for the durability of the concrete and proper placement of the concrete. We studied the detailing requirements for flexure and for shear and torsion. For flexure, the primary importance goes in laying the tendon properly. For a simply supported beam, the tendons are parabolic in nature. We studied the equation of the parabola and the CGS has to pass through the designed maximum eccentricity and the ducts are laid in the proper heights with the help of hangers or crossbars or chairs. The designing of the profile gets more involved in a continuous beam where the tendon comes down in the span and goes up over the supports. In that type of continuous profile, we have to identify the points of maximum eccentricity at the span and at the supports. We have to identify the points of contraflexure and then we join a point of maximum eccentricity with a point of contraflexure by parabolic segments. The points of contraflexure are designed based on the requirement of a minimum curvature of the tendons over the supports and the parabolic segments are determined by an equation which has to satisfy two boundary conditions. It should have zero slope at the point of maximum eccentricity and at the point of contraflexure, the slopes of the two parabolic segments on the two sides should match. Based on these two requirements, we determine the equations for each parabolic segment as we go along the different spans of the continuous beam and once we get the parabolic equations, we can determine the tendon profile. Once the tendon profile is determined, they should be shown in the design drawings so that the duct is laid properly through the length of the member. We also seen that after the stretching, the CGS of the tendons shifts from the center line of the ducts. If we need precise calculations, then we can consider the shifts in our design checks. Next, we learn about the requirements for longitudinal steel. The first requirement is that we have to have a minimum amount of longitudinal steel such that the strength is higher than the cracking load of the member. The minimum amount of longitudinal steel is given as a summation of 
the pre-stressing steel and non-pre-stressed steel if we have any and that minimum amount of steel should be provided to have a strength which is higher than the cracking load. In that situation the member will not attain its strength right after cracking. We have also seen that in case of unbounded tendons we need to provide some longitudinal reinforcement to check the growth of cracks. This longitudinal reinforcement is not indented to carry flexure and this reinforcement is distributed in the bottom phase to distribute the formation of the cracks and the cracks will have smaller crack width. There is another minimum requirement of longitudinal reinforcement that is the side phase reinforcement. If the depth of the web is large then we have to provide minimum amount of steel in the two phases but with a maximum spacing. This steel is intended for to check the thermal and shrinkage cracks. The maximum spacing of the reinforcement is provided to check the thermal and shrinkage cracks. The next set of requirements were regarding the spacing between the tendons. There should be a clear spacing for the flow of the concrete and the development of the bonds. We had seen the requirements for individual tendons and for grouped tendons. Another important requirement is the minimum cover which should be provided not only at the bottom of the beam but also at the sides. The minimum requirement is a cover requirement is based on the environment. If the environment is aggressive or extreme then we can increase the minimum cover of 20 millimeters for a pretension member and 30 millimeters for a post tension member to higher values so that we do not have durability problems during the service life of the structure. Next we moved on to the detailing requirements for shear. The shear reinforcement which are the stirrups should be provided within a maximum spacing such that each diagonal crack is intercepted by at least one stirrup. The requirement is the of the spacing is 0 0.75 times dt where dt is larger of the depth of the pre-stressing steel or the non-pre-stressed reinforcement. Now this requirement is stringent when the shear demand is large. And next we found that there is a minimum amount of shear reinforcement necessary to check shear failures. We also studied the detailing of torsional reinforcement, the anchorage of torsional reinforcement by providing adequate hooks at the ends. With this we are ending the design of members. In our next module we shall move on the design of members for shear and torsion. Thank you.